PGCE Research Bytes from the team behind Emma and Tom Talk Teaching. Welcome back to PGC Research Bytes, everyone, um, where we showcase excellent student work, um, the research that they've been doing over the course of our PGC programme here at Cardiff Met, and how theory and practice have been integrating, working together to help them move forward with their classroom practice. Um, I'm delighted to introduce you to one of my personal tutees and someone who's on my PGC Secondary Drama programme, Lucy Gooding. Welcome to PGC Research Bites. How thank you very you? much for having me. I'm very well, thank you. Glad to hear it. So we'll get straight into the nitty gritty. <clears throat> We're here to talk about assignment two. Um, and for assignment two, you were asked to select a theme or two themes, Max, that were really important to you in your developing practice. So first question is, what did you choose and why? So originally, um, I looked at the idea of teacher and role, process drama, learning through the experience, um, rather than just focusing on the product. Um, and I thought it was a bit broad, so I wanted to look at the skills that you needed um, to have to be successful in process drama. So um, speaking and listening came to the forefront, obviously. Yeah. Um, and I thought back to a on-campus session, subject session we had before Christmas, where I was first introduced to the concept of Aussie. Um, and then I thought about uh, school-led training day we had about cross-curricular responsibilities. And um, without even thinking about it, I put speaking and listening at the top of my list for the subject of drama. Yeah. Um, so I did some more research around that. Um, and I became even more interested because um, I discovered that previously there's been an assumption that pupils um, arrive in education knowing how to talk and how to communicate um, effectively. Mm. When... Um, in fact, that's not necessarily the case, especially with pupils from um, deprived areas and poorer backgrounds. Their home life is not rich with talk, um, rich with collaboration, and they don't know how to effectively communicate. And as educators and cl classroom practitioners, I feel like we'd be, be naive if we ignored that statistic. Mm -hmm. So I think it's our job to teach these pupils how to talk um, and not then, if you like, unintentionally neglect them in that aspect because they need these skills to be able to be successful in a wider world context and I think we'd be doing them an injustice if we ignored that fact. Wow really useful to hear your journey and also the kind of different aspects of the program that fed into you choosing that theme you said there was a, a, a lecture at university an SLT day so it kind of theory practice lots of the different settings they all helped you to kind of arrive at this at this focus I'm really interested in what you said about these assumptions that we might hold about how well pupils can talk um, and how that how they learn to talk. And I wonder if in drama, just thinking about it as an authentic context for developing oracy, it is you know something that we we can do well, we could do well. But do you think that there are any kind of problematic assumptions that even drama teachers might hold about how we do that in the classroom and whether it happens by osmosis or whether we actually really do try and teach it strategically? Yeah, I think going off what you just said, um, drama as a discipline does lend itself well to all receive authentically and naturally. Um, but I think as teachers and classroom practitioners, we have to remain aware of other types of conversation that our pupils are having um, because I was in the assumption as well that just because they're talking doesn't mean the quality of talk is actually helping them to develop then, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, we need to make sure that we structure these conversations and help these pupils to or equip these pupils with the correct skills to ensure that they arrive in a shared purpose through um, a successful way then, if you like. Because through my literature and my research, I came across different types of talk that you might find in a classroom setting. Um, you've got disputational, which is very blunt, very argumentative. Then if you like, you've got cumulative, which is more positive, where pupils build upon and elaborate on each other's answers. But there's no, probing there's no question there's no criticality so it's all very positive and happy then if you like and then I came to uh, explorative talk where pupils question each other 
They are sharing their opinions, they're understanding each other's perspectives to arrive at a shared conclusion. And as drama teachers, or as any teacher, we need to make sure that is the talk that is um, prominent in our drama classrooms and for the learning to be successful. Fantastic, really interesting. And I can hear already how literature was informing your practice. And I wonder, is there anything else um, that you came across in the literature, any kind of particular approaches, sources in particular, that helped to address some of those preconceived ideas um, that you had before you started doing this work? Yeah, so I read um, a really good book actually, which was probably the foundation of my assignment um, by um, Amy Gordon Alice Stott, yeah. um, written quite recently. And it put Oracy into perspective and how it hasn't been um, given the recognition that it deserves. And it, the book gave you ways in which you can include oracy based activities in um, your classroom lessons, your... Um, Practice. Practice then, yeah, if you like. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I used those to maybe see if they work well, see how I would do them differently. That's really interesting. And I, I know that particular book. I've used it in my own teaching. And, and it's quite useful, isn't it? Because it's got really kind of practical. It's got the theory, but it's got the practical approaches that are really helpful for informing your, your pedagogy and practice. I know that you read some other theorists and big theorists in this field as well. Did you want to bring anybody else to the fore? Yeah, so I looked at works by um, Professor Neil Mercer and Dr. James Mannion and how Oracy is um, presented then and finally given its recognition in the new Welsh curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, I also looked at Voice 21, who are a charity who advocate for um, pupils and their talk and their Oracy and their voices, which was really interesting as well because um, I think I empathise with their passion for it, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It really does. And I suppose something that you did well in your assignment as well was that you used their kind of oracy framework as well, the linguistic dimension, the cognitive. Um, so really interesting. But what I really want to know is how that literature then informed your practice. So did you make any changes to what you were doing in the classroom based on what you read? Um, yeah, I suppose I did. I used one of um, Gordon Stott's um, practical activities with my year 13 class, okay. where um, they had to place themselves on a, like, an invisible line of agreement, if you like. And I put uh, statements on the board. Mm -hmm. And these statements were related to um, a specific character they were looking at from one of their plays. Mm -hmm. And my aim was to get them thinking about this character's motivation but also through um, the medium then of talk, if you like. So I was, I was aiming to symbiotically develop their subject knowledge and their, um, and their ability to talk then, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really interesting to see where these pupils placed themselves physically first without saying anything. Mm -hmm. And then I got them to, and I questioned them and challenged them about why they thought that and how their opinion differs to somebody else who was on a different um, part of the line. And that was really interesting to um, see in practice, in person, after reading that through the literature, if that makes sense. That was one of my favourite. Um, mm, that's a really good example. And I, and I know from reading your assignment um, and from the work that we've done in our drama sessions that there's a, a nice link between oracy um, and learning through talk and learning to talk and drama, where we learn through drama and we learn about drama. So it's just interesting that there's that nice, you, caught, you used a lovely word there, that kind of symbiotic relationship yeah. between the two. Did you do anything else um, with your, because you've got research and inquiry time um, when you're on school placement. And you, that's part of this assignment. Part two asks you to kind of show how you developed it in practice. So was there anything else that you did to try and develop this by using your research and inquiry time? Yes. Yeah, so one of the um, sections of my part B, I labelled or I titled then um, a school-based approach. And um, I started looking at the things that we... Um, were given on our school-led training day um, and we had a talk from the ORC champion um, in my clinical practice school. Mm -hmm. So after I decided that I was going to focus on ORC and its importance in, in the curriculum, I decided to contact him to hold a professional learning conversation as I wanted to see um, A, the way that the school was um, 
the school was approaching oracy and how it was feeding oracy through each discipline. But I also wanted to get a professional opinion on oracy anyway, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So he shared with me um, a variety of resources that he was um, aiming to share with staff. And a lot of them were from the Oracy Pioneers Programme. Mm -hmm. And they were some really good resources which help formative assessment in Oracy because I feel like one of the reasons why Oracy hasn't been given its place is because it's difficult to assess. Mm -hmm. It is um, fleeting, it's not concrete, it's not hard evidence. Um, it's ephemeral then, if you like, which is why I think attention has sort of shied away from it. But going off what the Oracy Champion said as well, um, through technology, through our increasing um, arsenal of using technology, then, if you like, mm -hmm. um, it is finally, and the Welsh Curriculum, finally get in the place that it deserves, if that makes sense. Do you mean because we can capture it in a way that kind of tackles the fact that it is ephemeral and it's here and then it's gone and mm -hmm. capturing that moment can be difficult? Is that is that what you mean? Yeah, it's hard evidence. And I think drama, practical drama, has the same problem. It's difficult to assess because it's there and then it's gone, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. And great that you could tap into the kind of really situated and contextual expertise of somebody who has that responsibility in school to help you understand how school are addressing it and, and whether that chimes with the literature. Okay, um, so thinking about the future now, you are going to be starting your first job in September. You've learned a lot from this assignment. Um, and I'm just really keen to know how what you've done in assignment two is going to potentially influence what you do in the future in your in your new job. Yeah, coming from um, a personal point of view, it's only this year that I've been introduced to the four strands of oracy. You've got physical, linguistic, cognitive and social and emotional. Before doing my PGC, I wasn't aware of those. Um, I think I was subconsciously, but I'd never been taught them explicitly then, if you like. And what I'm interested in doing is if we show these four strands to our pupils, teach them about each one, will our pupils have a better understanding of oracy if we teach them tangibly these four strands of oracy? Um, so I want to look at that. And also, during my time on clinical practice too, I was able to observe um, a lot of English lessons, mm. especially during the enrichment weeks. And uh, year time, we're working on the unit one, which is um, an individual presentation. And I was interested to see how two different disciplines, English and drama, approach um, an oracy task, again, if you like, and how drama looks at the physical aspect of it, whereas English looks more at maybe the linguistic and what goes into it. Um, and how two different disciplines would teach them the same thing, if you like, or have a stronger focus depending on which subject you're looking at. And I thought that was really interesting. So fascinating. And, you know, it is, it is an old alliance, actually, English and drama. But you made a really good point when we were prepping for this interview that... In Wales, our AOLEs are, are different. So it makes it, it makes a really good point about the importance of cross AOLE working, doesn't it? But making sure that drama and English are working together. This was a fantastic assignment and it was really great to see you grappling with theory and practice and interrogating one against the other. You've recommended quite a lot already, but was there anything else that you would recommend for anybody else to watch, listen to, read? Um, so I've already said Gordon Stott's book, which yeah. was amazing. Whatever you teach, I would highly recommend that. Mm -hmm. um, I would have a look at Robin Alexander's a Dialogic Teaching Companion. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was really interesting. It's quite a challenging read, I feel. Um, there's a lot of terminology to get your head around, mm -hmm. but they explain it quite well. And Alexander puts a lot of emphasis, again, on the history of oracy in the curriculum. Wow, you've mentioned lots of really great sources there. And I know that in your first job, you've got a big sort of ALN connection and remit, haven't you, in that post? Um, and I know that in your assignment, you mentioned the significance of uh, pupils with English as an additional language. Anything on that front that you want our listeners to know? Yeah, definitely. Like you just said, my clinical practice school had a high percentage of um, English as additional language learners. And um, I read a really good book by Mike Gerton called How to Teach EAL um, in the Classroom, mm -hmm. a complete study guide, I think. 
And what that book pointed out, what the literature suggested was how to teach these pupils, or see how to teach these EAL learners how to talk effectively, but without um, singling them out and still doing it by creating an inclusive environment. So I'd recommend that book too. Really interesting and lots of crossover there with, you know, your focus and then other areas of education that are incredibly important. Lucy, you've given us a wealth of information there and hopefully some ideas about how other student teachers could maybe influence their own practice with oracy, but also how they use research and inquiry to, to move themselves forward. So thank you very much. No problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah.